again why because praising God stirs up expectancy for a future deliverance when you praise God for what he's already delivered you from it lets you know that if he brought me through that most certainly he can bring me through this you begin to tally up what God brought you through yeah I was hooked on drugs check that off yeah I used to be a whoremonger check that off yeah I used to be broke check that off yeah I used to be in a bad relationship Check that off. Ain't no secret what God can do. It stirs up expectancy for something else that you got before God. Secondly, when you praise God, it breaks up the dichotomy that exists between your mind, body, and your soul. Praising God is one of the few times that your mind, body, and soul works on one accord. Your mind, the Bible says, with the mind do we serve the Lord. There's also another passage that says, with my body do I serve the law of sin. And your soul gets caught up in the fight. And that with your mind you're trying to serve God, but your body is telling you something else. And your soul is caught up. But my soul cries out to the Lord when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me. My soul takes charge and he begins to cry out to the Lord. When my soul cries out, my mind catches hold of what my soul is doing. And I command my hands to praise the Lord. I command my feet to praise the Lord. So my mind, my body, and my soul. Praising God for past deliverance is more fervent, more fragrant, and more vital than praising God for future deliverance. When you praise God for past deliverance, it's a stronger praise. Because has God ever shown you what almost happened to you if he hadn't closed the door on you? Am I the only one? Am I, am I the only one that, that God showed me what I was about to get into? Am I the only one that, that, that God showed me that you were about to make a bad mistake, but I closed the door behind you? Am I the only one that God has shown the things that he's brought me through? Oh my goodness. That's the type of praise when you can praise God for the things he's already done. It eventually spills over into worship. When you praise God for what he's going to do, if you don't get it, eventually you're going to stop praising him for it. I know you ain't going to say nothing to me, but when you praise God for what he's already done, that provokes God to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or even think. Now, back to the text. God has brought Moses and the children of Israel down to the Red Sea. Now they are terrified because Pharaoh is down behind them. They got word that Pharaoh has gathered his choicest chariots and gathered his army and he's coming behind them to get them back or to destroy them. Now they prayed for deliverance ideologically. They loved the idea of being delivered. They prayed for deliverance theoretically because they said if we get delivered we're going out into the wilderness to worship God. But when they begin to receive deliverance experientially by experience, the dichotomy raised up in their spirits because the way God was bringing them out did not match what they thought God should be doing to bring them out of what they were going into. They could not wrap their minds around God marching them through the wilderness the way that he did. They could not wrap their minds around God leading them to the Red Sea to be destroyed or to be captured. So it caused a dichotomy to exist in their lives because they didn't understand God's exit strategies. God will bring you out. But before he does, he has to show your enemies that he's a man of war and the Lord is his name. God will bring you out. But before he does, he's got to show the enemy that he's not just chasing you and you're running away like a coward. He has to show the enemy that though he is chasing you, that you're running into the name of the Lord. Yeah. 
He has to show the enemy, you may be chasing my son now, but sooner or later, my son going to make it to the house. You may be chasing him down now, but he is a righteous man. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower to where the righteous run into it and they are saved. So you may be chasing him now, devil, but you're not righteous. And when they make it to the house, they're going to call me before they get there. Sometimes the enemy chases chases you and chases you back to your knees. When you get on your knees, you begin to call on the Lord. You say, Daddy God, the devil is on my track. You say, Daddy God, he's chasing me down. And he said, just make it to the house. If you can make it to the house, I'm coming out with the shotgun. If you can make it to the house, just let me see him after you. And the Lord will fight your battles for you. And the enemy you see today, you will see them no more forever hey. see the enemy might be on your track now he might be chasing you now he might be on your track and every time you turn around it's something else but if you can make it to God's house if you can make it into God's presence if you can call on God before you get there he'll be waiting with open arms and if the enemy's bad enough to keep coming God gonna buckshot him if the enemy's bad enough to keep coming God gonna do something bad to him so if you can make it to God's presence if you can just make it to the presence of the Lord. Amen. Come unto me all ye that labor. He didn't say come unto me all ye that got it all together. He didn't say come unto me all of you that walk upright 24 hours a day. He didn't say come unto me everybody that wear the suit just right or, or, or got everything lined up to where you don't really need God. He said come unto me all ye that labor and are heavily burdened. And he says I, says I will give you rest. He said, I will give you rest for your weary souls. So now, they're standing at the edge of the Red Sea. Moses is standing there. The children of Israel are standing there. But God has stopped moving. God stopped speaking. But Pharaoh is wide open with his chariots trying to get down behind him. God isn't moving anymore. They're stuck, Red Sea in front, miles of land on either side, and Pharaoh down behind them. And seemingly, they ran directly into a trap. Yeah. Seemingly, God led them into a trap. But what they didn't realize is that God was using them as bait for the enemy. God was using them to lure the enemy into a fight in the Red Sea. Yeah. Exodus. 14 and 1. I'll read it for you. God is a master strategist. He said, speak unto, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon. Before it, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land. The wilderness has shut them in. He said, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. So, so God led them to the sea had them zigzagging across the desert so Pharaoh could think man these people lost now they ran right into a red sea and I'm about to destroy them but to fight a child of God is to fight God himself if you belong to God even though your life may be beaten battered bruised and torn that if the enemy comes against you he coming against God too and God is a master strategist it may seem like you don't know where you're going you may not even know where you're going but if you are a righteous man your steps are ordered by the Lord God my Savior oh God they don't hear me Jesus God told Moses, stretch out your rod and stretch out your hand. He told Moses when they got to the edge of the Red Sea to stretch out his hand. 
And when he stretched out his hand, the Bible says God sent a strong east wind. When he stretched out his hand toward the sea, the Bible says God sent a strong east wind. And the wind blew over the Red Sea. And it blew over the Red Sea so long till it says the ground was dry. Yeah. 